Hey folks, so my students and I were recently invited to give the keynote talk at Massachusetts, Massachusetts College's online annual conference in mid-June. Uh, the setup would be that I would give a short talk and then we would turn to the panel with the students to hear more from them. Uh, I decided to re-record the talk here for folks as again with other things that I've been sharing. Uh, I think there's valuable information and ideas here that are worth uh, just learning a bit more about and making sure are out there in the conversation. So. Here goes the talk. Uh, so I started with obviously a thank you to, to being invited there, the opportunity to, to talk with them, and obviously to bring students. Um, and then I dove into, you know, I can remember my first time at Massachusetts College's online conference. This was back in 2012. Uh, when I came to the conference for this first time, it was such a delight to be in a community with so many folks from around Massachusetts, many of whom have become colleagues and friends and collaborators. Uh, it was just, it was such a proud moment for me to be asked to, uh, to come. But what I was even more excited about is that the organizers agreed that the idea of bringing students to be on the panel, uh, that really excited me. That really made me feel like this was important and that they recognized the importance of students in this conversation. Because the message I will hammer home time and again in this brief talk is that to talk to your students, build trust with your students, and collaborate with your students. This certainly won't solve all of the challenges and concerns that generative AI represents, but god dang, it will inevitably surprise you and open up more opportunities. So before I get too much into that, I just want to provide a brief bit of background on myself. Uh, I've been teaching since 2006 in higher education. Uh, in fact, I started at North Shore Community College, and uh, I've probably taught over the years 120 to 130 college courses in a variety of disciplines. Early on, I was doing that full-time adjunct thing in the late 2000s, and that led me into instructional design, where uh, because when you teach nine face-to-face -face courses and two online courses in a semester, you really need to make synergistic choices that utilize technology effectively. So I got my start at North Shore Community College as an instructional designer, and for 12 years I've worked at the intersection of technology and higher education throughout several Massachusetts colleges and universities. Uh, during this time, it developed a deeper consideration and participated in rich and complex conversations about the roles of technologies in our world. And of course, in the last decade, uh, the rise of movements like Black Lives Matter, Standing Rock, Me Too, and other organizations and communities have risen up to bring our attention to the ways that technologies can be both empowering and complicit in historical and contemporary violence toward BIPOC folks, the LGBTQIA community, people with disabilities, and other groups that have been pushed to the periphery. Those things too have made me think about the pedagogical practices, the technologies that I use, and the ways that I work with faculty. All of this led me to College Unbound as the Director of Digital Pedagogy, where as a young college still building its infrastructure as it grows, I have to think deeply about what technologies we bring into practice, given that we serve a largely adult population that is 70, more than 70% women of color. Being thoughtful of the possibilities and downstream effects of technology is particularly important for our students who are often digitally surveilled and digitally redlined, that is subject to technology rather than agents of technology. And so it is with that, uh, it's with a lot of that thinking um, around those things that I start this presentation with an equity acknowledgement to further ground our conversation. So this pres presentation was prepared using ChatGPT. I acknowledge that ChatGPT and many generative artificial intelligent tools do not respect the individual rights of, sit of authors and artisans artists and ignore concerns over copyright and intellectual property in the training of the system. Additionally, I acknowledge that this AI system was trained in part through exploitation of precarious workers in the global south. Also, I recognize that structures to support the expanse of AI rests on the continued large-scale extraction of resources from environments in methods that have long effects on local populations. And in the end, many of those resources, such as hardware, are often causing further har harm in global climate change and environmental degradation, particularly indirectly for the global south and communities that historically and presently marginalized. In this work, I specifically use ChatGPT as a collaborative exercise and test out some ideas about its usage, better understand the tool, and may also demonstrate some of the ways it generates answers. Uh, this acknowledgement was um, inspired by and adapted from Laurie, and Flip, Laurie Phipps and Donna Lank, uh, Lacklos's 
and offering, a blog post I highly encourage to take a look at and is in the resources. So I'm closely approaching 45, uh, and while Douglas Adams still remains a strong influence in my life, uh, it makes me wonder if this quote by him has pushed me not to believe that technology is against the natural order of things, but to think more critically and uh, about the value exchange that technology offers. Um, I hope we, I'm hoping we can all sit in this place and not necessarily uh, identify everything as against the order, natural order of things as we grow older. And so before we get too much further, I just want to mention that I'll be referring to several documents and resources. You can find those resources in the description below for your reference and use. Uh, most of them were created with uh, Creative Commons licenses, so you are welcome to reuse those. So when ChatGPT dropped in December 2022, uh, it landed mostly with a thud. Many folks were wrapping up the what they perceived, real or otherwise, as their first normal semester since the pandemic started in spring 2020. Uh, it could be understood why folks weren't paying attention to some new tech being touted by tech bros and anyone with an opinion on Twitter. But some of us in higher ed did hear about it and did start to realize the implications of ChatGPT. Folks like Maha Bali, Brian Alexander, Autumn Keynes, and others were beginning to have public conversations before the end of December. Here too, I started to play, play with it and share some of my own thoughts publicly, as I'm apt to do, whether on social media or uh, on my blog. Autumn Keynes, a colleague and friend of mine, came to me with an interesting question about its possible appearance and use by someone in our class at College Unbound. We got on a Zoom call and we talked about what we did, uh, what, this, what did this mean, and how did we want to think through it. Uh, I'm indebted to her for her insight and deliberation as we moved from concern to curiosity, from angst to excitement, and honestly, some respect for the potential students for so quickly leveraging a tool in a new way. But, and that's a big but, College Unbound centers student voices and works to address the educational trauma that a reasonable share of our students experience at the hands of traditional education. Any framework where we even began to accuse students directly or indirectly felt like a dangerous place for us to go. A false positive would be antithetical to what we stand for. So we approach it with curiosity. Autumn posted a note to her students saying that she thought students might have been playing with this tool and she would love to learn more if they did. If they did. Uh, she didn't hear back from them. So I took a step further and put together an anonymous short survey and sent it out to all students. Uh, it asked if they knew about it, if they were using it, or if uh, in what other ways did they, did they use it. Um, we got back some results that showed students were using it to improve understanding, to navigate being multi-language learners, and brainstorming. These were useful insights, and so that led me to think that we needed to know more and think more deeply about it, and not to do so in the absence of students, but with students. So then I had an idea, and I'll be first to admit I have a lot of unnecessary or useless ideas, uh, but this one, well, this one, it was definitely one of those that I instantly knew was the right thing to do. I realized that a course on AI in education where the students I had learned about generative AI, while also playing with it and Thinking about it in an educational context would make for a great learning experience, and we could craft the guidelines for institutional policy. It struck me and made absolute sense. My provost was quickly on board, and we realized in general that this could be an ongoing structure, not just for generative AI, but other aspects of the college where we encountered new things, be it technology or other structural elements of the institution. My partner, because she's also brilliant, added to the idea where we could run the course twice. So at College Unbound, we have eight weeks uh, courses. And so for our instructional courses in, in the spring, we can run two courses, uh, spring one and spring two. So spring one, I ran the course to develop the policy with students. Spring two, we had additional students and we tested and piloted those guidelines with specific assignments that students had in other classes. The goal was for them to try it out and see if, if the if the guidelines made sense or consider loopholes or other issues. Um, I will share those materials again, the, the policy that they came up with, the, the syllabi, etc., in the uh, comment in the description below. So, but before the class could even start, our faculty needed guidance. So I put together, uh, put together and shared our 
generative AI strategy that both issued a temporary policy and provided a larger context for how we would get to something more stable. Once again, that link will be in the, the description below. At the same time, um, because, well, I've been doing this kind of work for a while and I'm deeply invested in open educational practices, I began to crowdsource generative AI policies in syllabi in sharing that out with folks so we all had examples to work with. And currently, in the document, there is over 40 examples, and you can add your own if you want to fill out the form at the top of the crowdsource document in uh, the description below. So the two classes were amazing, and I can't stress this enough. Having students join a class where their work will mean something, where they will further employ their agency, it is so beautiful. Uh, it led to a lot of discoveries and conversations and ways of understanding the tool that I just wouldn't have had were I just talking with other faculty or folks in higher ed. Students had a lot of initial and complicated feelings and thoughts, and throughout the course, they just continued to become more developed and thoughtful. They challenged one another in my own thinking as we played around with ChatGPT, read about it from the perspective, from different perspectives, and considered what does this tool mean for work, learning, and evaluation. This was evident early on and led me to see if students would be open to being on a panel at, NERCOMP, uh, at the NERCOMP conference in March 2022, 2023. Uh, students in NERCOMP were both interested, and so they spoke to a room of 30 leaders in higher education about their insights. And needless to say, the students crushed it. Uh, and at that point, I knew that while I had certainly had a have a place in this conversation um, because of the work that I've been doing, their voices, the students' voices, needed to be heard, and they need to be core to the conversation, both my students and students everywhere. So since then, um, I've continued to work with them and for us to find opportunities for them to be on podcasts and panels and featured in the Chronicle of Higher Ed and to really share their wisdom as they've been really thinking about this deeply. So as session, uh, as, as session, so session one of the AI in Education course came up with the guidelines and session two uh, edited that, a test drove them and edited them. Um, we are now just finishing up having faculty review them and are doing so in a very similar fashion, a collaborative document where faculty are using the comment feature to share thoughts, questions, and challenges. This is a great dialogue to watch kind of uh, go through a bunch of different faculty who may not have known each other or had much interaction, but are really um, just diving deep into this and making new realizations and helping one another think about this, which is just beautiful to see. Once done, the students will have a final look and will put it forward as a proposal for College Unbound to consider as institutional policy. Additionally, some students continue to meet with me as we look at different projects and opportunities, such as speaking engagements, podcasts, even writing projects. Uh, they've been invited to participate in uh, academic convocations as keynote panels and pa uh, leadership panels at national conferences. And so that thing I can't stress, you know, can't stress enough is just how powerful and important it has been for me to be in the space with them. Uh, they have many different lenses to be thinking about generative AI, ones that are substantially different from my own, and we as educators can often think that we know best and understand all of this in ways that are more important or relevant than students. We may think that is the case, but we're going to miss a lot if we make that assumption when it comes to this set of tools and how it will show up in all of our lives. So what has this semester showed me? Uh, the first is you know, when it comes to generative AI, you have to use it, get to know it deeply. There's a lot of writing about it, but many folks have only played with it in superficial ways. One of the resources I provide is a prompt guide to help you uh, really start to think about how you ask your questions, and another is a chat log that I copied to give you some sense of the different types of answers, the ways that you can, you know, pull knowledge, ideas, and insights from this tool. Students need to be part of the conversation, not a apart from the conversation. We need to recognize that there are ample ways that generative AI can be useful, and failing to do that will continue to lose legitimacy. Like there, you can point to lots of different reasons why we should be skeptical, we should be concerned. 1,000% those should be part of the conversation. But to not acknowledge that this is a helpful tool for many students, many people, is going to just dismiss um, anything else that we say. 
It's also really important for us in the educational field to not assume that we can tech our way to a solution that makes this easier. This is not a time to double down on, on dehumanizing or accusational plagiarism software and attempt to catch them. That road won't lead anywhere good. And just ask the professor in Texas who flunked all of his students, including graduating students, based on false positives. Play AI plagiarism software at this moment in time, and probably for the foreseeable future, is not is going to cause more harm than help. It's going to give faculty a false sense of security and, you know, oh, you know, I, this can help. And it's going to end up in lots of students being alienated by false accusations to which proving a proving that is a false uh, accusation against an AI machine to which, you know, we don't really see the underside of like that. That's impossible. That is, you know, it, it is putting students in impossible situations, which is really going to be scary uh, for that student and the long term implications. The hardest part will be figuring out which of our darlings to kill. And yeah, I know that's a horrible expression, but we're in the muddy space now. The space where a new technology represents a significant change to long-held practices and beliefs. Some of those practices can and should go away. The vast majority of, majority of us do not have the skills or have ever successfully started a fire with our bare hands and wood. Very few of us know how to set a typewriter ribbon. There are going to be skills or knowledge areas that we think are really important but actually aren't in an age of generative AI. And we should challenge every skill and piece of knowledge and be ready to adjust, reconsider, and put aside some. Not saying all, not saying we have to like just forget everything, but we really have to think and challenge the things we really, really feel are important versus the things that we realize just may not be anymore. We also, you know, recognize that these emerging tools will mean that we have to think differently about what classroom is for and how we relate. I think well, this will make, I think it will make us have to be more human, build more trust, and through that create more space for exploration and experimentation. If guided and targeted learning that is contextual to that student can happen all the time with generative AI, then what is the value proposition for the classroom? And finally, whatever problems we are trying to figure out in terms of students, the misuse of generative AI is a symptom of a much larger problem that has students to be deliberative, relaxed, and take the long way when our capitalist structure tells us, or tells us and tells them to take on everything, be filled with angst about the fragile nature of our lower and middle socioeconomic class standing, and that there is never enough cheese in this rat race, so they better haul ass and take the shortcut. Now, you'll probably notice that I'm not really talking about or giving substantial guidance to faculty in the short talk, and that's because, you know, today's message is really about the students. If you want to hear more about my thoughts and recommendations for faculty with more specific considerations from my lens, then I recommend these sources, um, including a talk that I've given at North Shore Community College and a blog post where I talk about different talks, some slide decks, um, and other resources that you will see in the um, description below. So at this point in the presentation, um, I had switched from being a moderator, from, from doing my talk to being a moderator and facilitating questions um, that the students participated in. I did end on a final note uh, in considering that the students I worked with, and while this may be true, uh, this may specifically apply to my students. I think there's pieces of it that are likely to apply to many students if you take the time to engage and listen. I know this goes without saying, but it's worth always saying. Please listen and hear what the students are saying. Recognize that their voices are important as anybody else in any of the rooms that you're going to be in higher education throughout your institution, and that my students and other students' work on exploring, studying, discussing, and writing about generative AI is already going to be more substantial than probably 75% of the people at your institution. So if nothing else, just remember that in order for us to best go forward, for us to really think through what higher education is about, it really does need to be about the students. So thank you so much. And if you have thoughts or comments or want to have further conversations, uh, hit me up in the comments section. Thank you.